Welcome everybody to this week's webinar session on leak moth management led by Nick Izzo and Scott Lewins of UVM. Great to have you both here. Take it away. Thanks, Vern. Um, my name is Scott Lewins. Uh, I'm an extension um, entomology educator with UVM Extension. Um, and I also teach in the plant soil science department at UVM. And Vic, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Uh, I'm, I'm Vic Izzo. I'm a lecturer in the plant and soil science department, and I'm also the educational coordinator for the Agroecology and Livelihoods Collaborative, which is housed within the PSS, the plant and soil science department here at UVM. So, and I'm an entomologist, technically. I guess I should also say that I am also the extension coordinator for, for ALC. Um, so Vic and I um, are the founding members, and in fact, the only members of the Vermont <laughs> Uh, Entomology Participatory Action Research Team, affectionately known as VPART. Um, we have been uh, working with Vermont growers since about 2015 um, to address Vermont problems um, with Vermont scaled solutions. Um, and if I don't say it at some point today, I will just mention that everything that we um, do all of the good ideas that um, we have looked at all come from growers. Um, the Veg and Berry Growers Association is our primary stakeholder um, group, and um, we have worked with a number of the members uh, over the years, um, again, coming up with uh, problems to test, uh, coming up with solutions that would work, um, and in fact, doing a lot of the research on um, commercial farms um, that are a part of the VBGA. So I just want to thank you all right off the bat, because um, without you, we're just <laughs> two fools kind of scrambling around in the dark. So um, Vic, do you want to say anything before we get into leak moth? Um, the only thing I'll say is that many of our strategies that we look to test are generally organic, um, but not exclusively. Um, so if you think that that's kind of the primary work we do, that's not necessarily true. So we don't only work with organic growers, just to give you a heads up. Cool. So why not, you know, Vic is uh, driving the, the computer um, that we're looking at. So um, we'll just start off right away. Um, most of you probably know um, Andy Jones from the Intervale Community Farm, but um, we're going to be talking about leak moth um, today and shortly after uh, it was apparent that leak moth was in Vermont and was um, a problem for Vermont vegetable growers to deal with. Um, this is a quote uh, from Andes that, that we really like. And so, you know, the story of the leak moth is a story that we growers face on a seemingly increasing frequency. An invasive pest arrives about which we know little and have few strategies to control. So this is kind of um, the seed, if you will, that, that planted this research program. Um, and so we work with Andy, as I mentioned, a number of um, uh, uh, growers in Vermont. Um, and so we started um, working on leak moth, like I said, in about 2015. Vic, why don't you go to the next slide? Right, so if you don't know, um, leak moth is um, a pest. It's a caterpillar. Um, you can see just to the right of my thumbnail, um, there's one of those little nasty caterpillars here in a garlic leaf. Um, why don't you click? Yeah, there we go. So as an adult, uh, it's about three eighths of an inch long. Uh, it's characteristic if you see an adult, and really the only place you would see an adult is on a sticky trap that's baited with a pheromone lure, and I'll talk about those in a moment. Um, but these moths fly at night, um, and if you have a trap out and you go out the next morning and you find one of these, you'll see a characteristic. Um, it's like a white diamond on the top of its wings. It's actually two two triangles that are side by side, one on each leaf that, that appear to look like a diamond. Um, or these really, um, they're called horn, people call them horns, they're, they're actually part of the mouth parts, um, but these um, structures that stick out from the face. So those are the characteristics uh, of the adult. Um, as I mentioned, it's invasive. Um, 
it was in Canada prior to coming into the U.S. in about 2009. Um, it's a pest of all allium crops. In fact, it probably feeds on all alliums, even non-crop uh, species. Um, people call it a leaf miner. So the caterpillar is what's doing the damage, not the, not the moth. Right, so the caterpillar that you saw at the beginning of this slide um, inside the, the garlic leaf, um, it, it's not actually a true leaf miner, and this gets into sort of the minutia, the, the entomological minutia. Um, a, a true leaf miner would be um, spending its entire um, larval stage between the cuticle, top and bottom cuticle of the leaf. Um, but as you can see in the picture um, behind um, the text here, um, it will feed on part of, thank you, Vic. Um, it'll feed on part of the cuticle as well uh, in the case of garlic. Uh, and you'll see a later picture of a garlic scape. It just gnaws on the scape. Um, but in, a, in an onion, which is the most common, um, probably most com the, the, the crop that you most commonly interact with, leek moth caterpillars, they feed on that hollow leaf tube. And so they're inside that tube. Um, and so that's why people call them leaf miners. But again, I'm not a big fan of of um, of jargon. So again, they're just feeding on the leaf, in some cases protected by the leaf tube uh, if it's hollow like an onion. Um, they're also multi-voltine. What that means is they have multiple generations in a uh, growing season. And in fact, because they're um, moths as adults, um, a lot of moths have these um, uh, synchronized um, flights that that occur at discrete times during the season and so in our area we have three discrete flights um one sort of the end of um april beginning of may another one mid-june and another one in in mid-july vic unless you want to add right. something no i just want to show you the size um so it's really small in comparison to oh, that's a perfect moth on a, on a trap next to a penny if you, if you know what a penny is, anyone use pennies? <laughs> um, so this is, uh, again, very different looking damage. Um, this is an, a, a heavily infested onion planting. In fact, there's a bunch of different things going on um, in this planting, um, including leek moth damage. And the leek moth damage in onions is typically called window painting. And I think we might have that. Um, yeah, there you go. So um, you can see that red circle um, around that, un that the um, leek moth damage in onions, the outer cuticle is intact. Uh, and so again, it looks like, kind of looks like if you squint, uh, a window pane. Um, yeah, go ahead to that next slide. And again, as I mentioned in garlic, the, on the scape, uh, it looks even even more different than than both the garlic leaf and onion leaf damage. So, yeah, right there uh, at the base of the scape, um, you can see the chewing damage uh, as well as the frass, or you know what we geeks call insect poop. All right. So this is um, again, as I mentioned, a very typical life cycle um, for for moths. Um, the adults overwinter throughout the landscape. Um, you, if you looked hard enough right about now, you could probably find uh, a leek moth somewhere under a bale of hay or, um, you know, behind the, the shingles on a barn. Um, they're, they're everywhere, um, but, uh, but not really in high numbers, not concentrated in one place. And so, um, so really, um, we don't really think about them this time of year um, until, again, once they've made it through the winter in about April when they start uh, emerging, mid-April or so. Um, when they do, the moths don't really fly very far, um, you know, maybe one to 200 meters. Um, and so we don't think of them as, quote unquote, strong flyers. Um, so when they emerge uh, in the evening, um, the moths will mate um, about 24 hours to 72 hours after the adult females emerge. The males emerge a little bit earlier, um, and then they mate. Um, they lay eggs. The females will lay eggs between 4 and 11 days after they emerge. Um, and then the caterpillars feed on the host plant. Again, you saw the damage um, in a variety of different uh, allium plants. Um, once they have gone through their complete larval development, so they're 
multiple larval stages. Uh, the caterpillars then emerge from their host plant and spin this webbed cocoon. So on the bottom right, uh, there's a picture of a, a green onion, a scallion with a, with a leek moth pupil case. And so you can see that the netting, uh, they spin a silk, and then inside there they go through metamorphosis. Um, and then after about 21 days from um, eggs being laid, uh, the new generation uh, of adults will emerge about 23 days. That process is highly dependent on temperature. So I mentioned the multiple flights. So the early flight, you know, if they're emerging in mid-April, it's still pretty cold. And so you're going to be on the higher end of the number of days uh, until they advance to the, nef to the next um, life stage. This is a nice um, graphic we stole from the Cornell website um, showing that whole process, um, the three generations, um, and the amount of time for each um, life stage to move to the next. Vic, do you want to add anything? No, I think that's good. Sweet. So as I mentioned, Vic and I started uh, working with this pest in about 2015. At that point in time, Cornell had a fairly active research program um, <coughs> monitoring leak moth, not just in New York, but they were working with uh, some, actually some of the Vermont growers as well, um, monitoring the invasion in the US. So Cornell was the first US institution to start um, working with this problem um, because it first made it into the US um, from Canada into uh, Northern New York, um, like the Plattsburgh area. Um, quickly after, the um, excuse me. Shortly after Cornell um, started working with the pest, they found uh, that you can relatively easily manage leak moth with systemic uh, insecticides, and so most of their growers were pretty happy with that solution. And so Cornell um, sort of transferred their research on leak moth over to us, basically, because uh, we were interested in, in other ways to manage leak moth beyond just uh, uh, conventional insecticide, the, the systemics that, that were quite effective out in the big onion uh, growing regions out in Western New York. Um, and so again, in about 2015, we started to expand our network of traps um, through a variety of funding sources. We es established a statewide program that lasted for a few years. Um, and th the map on the, the left-hand side of the screen, I think was from 2018. Um, we had a 20 sites throughout the, throughout the state. Um, we had set up these pheromone baited um, traps on almost exclusively commercial farms. Uh, although uh, we did have some um, at university, either university owned or um, leased research farms as well. And so our goal was really first to determine where leak moth was really an issue, because um, no one really knew. It was a relatively new invasive pest. It first, um, actually, I'll get into the, the um, invasion biology in a moment. Um, but I just want to point out that this was the sort of cornerstone of our research working with leak moth, was, was developing relationships with growers throughout the state, um, figuring out who was dealing with it and who isn't, because uh, there are still parts of the state as you'll see that that um, leak moth is just not going to be a problem. And and as we suspect, there might be areas of of the state that historically, at least in the last you know five years, have had problems with leak moth that that might not going forward. Right. So, um, so from the work that we did in 2015, 16, and 17. Um, we developed these heat maps. So basically the, the brighter or the darker, I should say, the red, um, the higher the number of, of moths per trap, right? Um, and if you see it's gray, that means we didn't have a trap. Um, and if it's white, that was, that was none. Um, and so uh, and one thing you'll get out of this is that in 2015, we, we were not trapping in as many um, counties in the state. Um, we, as I said, we sort of increased 
the reach of our trapping network um, as time went on, um, as we got funding uh, to, to do that. And we also worked with a large number of growers who were doing the trapping uh, on their farms themselves and then sharing the data with us. Um, I'll just point out one thing on two that in 2017, um, uh, Windsor County was white. Um, this this image here has it as gray, but we did in fact have traps there and there were none. And so what what I the take home from from uh, these heat maps is that again Plattsburgh was where it was first found in the U.S. Um, Alberg was where it was first found in Vermont. Um, and so over time, uh, the distribution um, increased from northwest corner of the state uh, down to the southeast. And again, at this point, we still don't believe that leak moth is in those bottom two southeast um, counties, Windsor and Wyndham. On the left-hand side, this is actually a slightly outdated map from Cornell showing the distribution in the U.S. Um, since this map was um, published by Cornell, um, at least one more county, Grafton County in New Hampshire, um, has had leak moth. So that would be like across uh, the river from Orange County, uh, Vermont. Um, and then at least one other county in Maine, uh, Aristic County, I believe, up in the northern part, um, has also uh, seen it. All right. So again, leak moth expanding its reach. Um, in the U.S. Uh, based on, again, our, our trapping as well as collaborators in, in other states. Um, so one of the things that, that got us really interested in working on leak moth, other than the fact that um, most of the growers that we are working with um, weren't interested in uh, systemic insecticides to deal with it, um, was also the potential distribution. So this is from a paper um, by is it Peter Mason up in Canada, um, yeah. sort of the premier leak moth um, researcher uh, in North America. And so they did, uh, they did some modeling. They used what's called a Climax model, um, which takes into consideration all of the, um, the abiotic factors, weather, um, temperature, climate projections, um, humidity, host plant. I guess that's not uh, abiotic. Uh, in any case, to come up with what the, our best guess for um, where is favorable or very favorable um, versus unfavorable. Um, and you can see that you've got a good more than a third of, um, of Canada and the U.S. is, is favorable um, for leak moth. Uh, and so even though it, it, it was in a relatively small area uh, in the U.S., the concern is um, going forward that the, the invasion um, would increase the area affected. All right, so when we started the um, work, working with Vermont growers, there were a few sort of tried and true um, methods for managing leak moth. Um, based on research that was done in, in Canada. Um, and so really understanding when the flights are occurring is crucial uh, because they, they are only laying eggs during basically three, um, sorry, excuse me, only during two windows. Uh, when the female moths emerge in the first flight and when the female moths emerge in the second flight, right? That's when they're gonna mate and lay eggs. The third flight, those moths um, over winter, so they're not laying eggs, right? So again, having that timing uh, for when let eggs are potentially being laid is important, right? And one of the, the, the most common ways to deal with that, at least up in Canada, was using floating row covers. So they don't grow as many onions, but they, garlic was, is really seriously impacted. So on the bottom left, um, it's a picture out of Ontario. Uh, you can see the, the row cover on this. This is actually from a research farm, um, but you can see this trial, they were looking at, um, at the level of protection from just having that row cover right over, uh, no hoops or anything, um, right over the garlic plants. Um, and it's nice because at least on a smaller scale, um, you can get in there, you can do what you want during the day, because again, leak moths um, are nocturnal. Uh, so anything that you do during the day, if that, that row covers pulled off, 
um, the plants are not going to be vulnerable. Um, the, the issue with this is it doesn't scale up very well. Uh, if you've dealt with large pieces of row cover, um, you know exactly why. Uh, actually, on the right-hand side, this is a nice picture. This is from the St. Michael's College um, farm. I used to work at St. Michael's College, and we have a good working relationship with the farm manager there. Uh, and we had a bunch of um, student research projects, uh, and they found it actually works really well. They looked at different mulch types, um, but they they were using um, the ProtectNet um, with hoops, and this was really nice with the mulch. They could just set it and forget it essentially. Um, so again, the the Onion growers that are using row cover um, find that, it, again, the um, Protect Net works really well because you can leave it on later into the season and the airflow is really, really good and you don't get um, increase, as much of an increase in temperature um, as you would with, with a remay or that type of row cover. Go for it, Vic. Right. Uh, and so, again, this is out of the research in New York um, looking at chemical controls. Um, and that blue line that goes across is separating above the blue line are the conventional um, chemicals that they looked at, and below the green, blue line um, are the, the OMRI-approved um, chemicals. And you'll notice that, that spinosad is the only organic chemical um, that they found any sort of um, a significant level of control, right? And so... So we know that spinosad um, can be effective. Um, and in fact, anecdotally, um, not from this particular project, but, but from uh, discuss discussions with some Canadian growers, um, they find that spinosad followed by uh, several um, BT applications can, can extend that level of control. Um, and, and the importance of, of the the trapping is, again, if you know when the moths are flying, you know when they're laying eggs, um, especially with onions, that's that crucial period where you want to get that chemical on. Because once the, once the caterpillars move inside the leaf tube, or at least they're protected in the case of garlic, um, they're far less susceptible to, to chemicals. And, I, and I'll just add that the DAT on top just means uh, days after treatment. So two days after treatment, four days, and eight days, just uh, in case people are wondering. Awesome. Thanks, Vic. Yeah. All right. Um, so I guess that's the pass off of the baton to me. It's so, all you. Um, so what what we did, given the what we saw as very little research um, useful for growers that were looking to apply non chemical controls, um, we went to the literature, and we all we really saw was um, kind of research coming out of the former research lab in Cornell, or the Cornell Research Lab, their former research that they looked at the, the row covers and the, the actual uh, exclusion netting. We, we thought a lot of growers that, we, like we said at the beginning of this talk, we were chatting with some of our growers, like what type of tactics other than chemical, uh, organic chemical applications or even conventional, what other strategies would you be interested in, in us testing? And, and one of the things that several growers said, well, well is there any genetic variability amongst these different uh, onions specifically, because most of the research in Canada was looking at leeks and garlic. There wasn't a ton of onion research, so there wasn't a lot of uh, there wasn't a lot of data around the genetic differences between these varieties. So we that was at first we hit the ground running doing that. We're like it's a really low hanging fruit or a low hanging or well growing onion maybe um, <laughs> big leafed onion. Um, and so one of the things that we first wanted to identify because. Heather Darby, who um, was one of the first people to identify or find uh, leek moth in Alberg, she pointed out to us that she noticed that red and yellow onions seemed to have, have different levels of susceptibility. Um, so what we did was we kind of looked at this as a, a two-level uh, two uh, investigation where we looked at yellow onions and all different varieties within yellow onions, and then red onions, all different varieties, and saw if there was any uh, preference for specific varieties. And so we selected varieties uh, based upon a survey that we put out to the Veg and Barrier Listserv saying what are the most common varieties of red and yellow onions that you use on your farm. And then we took the top six um, for each of those. And so as you can see here, um, for the yellow onions, uh, one thing that I want to point out is, and it'll become relevant later, is that we did select some varieties that had uh, differences in age to maturity or, or time to maturity. 
And that's going to be relevant when we talk about when you're actually harvesting your onions and how it synchronizes with the flights of those um, leek moth. Another thing I want to point out also is that these were done consecutively in consecutive years. The first year we did yellow onions and the second year we did red onions. And then we did a combined study having both uh, red and onion, red and yellow, um, which I'll talk about the reasons why we did that. We did just a very basic kind of agronomic study where we randomized complete block design, which basically just allows for controlling differences. Well, we get some replication, right, to control for random effects. Um, so any type of randomness that might be affecting whether or not those leek moths feed on certain onions. Um, and then we put them into these blocks to account for, to control for differences um, in the soil, perhaps, or area um, within a bed that might change whether or not uh, the leek moth might be affected. So, um, so basically we did the exact same design for both the yellow and red years. And again, this is just kind of showing you guys what it looked like. We had about 90 onions per plot. Um, so that was quite a, a number. Um, and then what we did was we just measured or recorded above ground damage. So any of that damage at window painting in the onions, and you could kind of see some of those here. Um, and then we looked for bulb damage within the bulbs after we pulled them out of the field to see if there was any um, leak moth that got into the bulb. And then we stored them. And after six months, we looked at them to see if any of those leak moth kind of emerged. Because what essentially happens is the larvae generally are found on the leaf tube and when you bring them into storage, they'll move down into the bulb and they'll exit through the bulb, or at least a certain number of them. So that's why we stored them first and looked to see if there was any damage in the bulb. So above ground damage and then below ground damage. And generally the below ground damage is what we're mainly concerned about, right? Um, so as far as above ground damage or leaf damage, yellow onion displayed greater than 70% across all um, of the later maturing varieties. And just keep that, keep that in mind that the that the early maturing variety, we're going to talk about how that was different. Um, but basically, yellow onions got hammered in our study. And this was all done at the, at the Horticultural Research and Education Center um, at the University of Vermont. By contrast, the red onions exhibit significantly less, kind of, again, uh, underscoring what, what uh, I pointed out. We had about less than 10% incidence across all, of diff all the red varieties. So, Looking, so basically that, that hypothesis of are red onions less susceptible it seems to be correct. That seems to be, test, we tested it and it seems that red onions do seem to be less susceptible at least within two different years. So that was the problem with this experimental design was we tested one, uh, the yellow onions in one year and then the next year we tested the, the red onions. And so we were kind of like, well, we, this does align with what Heather said and what some other growers have pointed out, but we did it in different years. So there might be a, some effect of the, the, the year and the number of leak moth or the timing of those flights that might have affected the amount of damage in those um, onions respectively. Um, but then we looked at the bulb damage and we didn't really look at the, the red onion bulb damage because there was such little damage above ground and we basically saw no bulb damage in the red onions at all in storage. So I'm not gonna show the data for the red onions, but this is the yellow onions data. And basically all of the late maturing varieties had significant uh, amounts or significantly more uh, numbers of exit holes from leaf moth larvae exiting the bulb and bridger which was the earliest maturing variety had relatively none had like one or two onions that had any exit holes in them and so the the um it's getting blocked but let me hide this hold on a second it has on my screen let me hide this. we can see there we go okay you guys can say but i couldn't read it um so <laughs> as i said before the bridger the early maturing variety uh exhibited significantly less bulb damage compared to the other storage onions. And so, again, we brought this back to our, our participatory action research growers. So we have like a group of growers that we confer with each year at the end of the season. And we gave them this data and we're like, well, what do you guys think about this? Should we all invest in later maturing varieties? What do you think are some next questions? You know, what's the next step that you think might be useful um, given this data? And some of the subsequent research questions that emerged from that meeting was the first one was that, okay, are they real, are red onions, so several people said, okay, you did these two different years, but are they really susceptible, or is this idea of different years the major reason why we're seeing a difference? So they said, okay, go back to the drawing board and actually test the red onions and the yellow onions in the same year. We said, okay, we'll do that. Um, and then the second thing was, well, if the leaf tubes are housing larvae, when you bring them into storage, are, is there anything that we can do to remove the susceptibility of the bulb, i.e. remove the leaf tubes, from the bulb itself. 
Um, so if we really identify the leaf tubes are the ones that are housing the larvae, what can we do about that? And essentially that's kind of the two research questions that then we moved on to, to develop new research. Um, we received funding, we applied for funding to then test some other methods that might simply remove the, the leaf tubes from the onions during storage. But before that, of course, I want to show you the data. What we decided to do in relation to comparing red versus yellow, um, that says red versus onion variety trials. It should be red versus yellow onion variety tri trials. We, we took the, the, most, the best performing red onion, or the worst performing red onion, and the worst performing yellow onion. And then we put them out into the field together in a checkerboard. So we, we selected Sedona and Red Wing. And we simply put one, we created this checkerboard bed, basically, where we put one red onion and then the next was a yellow onion. Um, and so if there was any distinguishing, uh, if there was an ability for the leek moth to distinguish between those two onions, we would certainly see it, right? So if we saw a difference between yellow and red, there's certainly a pre preference difference here because they're right next to each other. The, the leek moth would have to really distinguish that I'm going to lay my eggs on this one, even though there's one right next to it. So it's not just randomly laying its eggs on any allium. Um, and what we saw... Actually, based, let me just really quickly interrupt. Um, yep. So the spacing that we chose for, for all the variety trials, and in fact, most of our trials, um, is typical in Vermont, um, although not exclusively grown this way, but um, it's in yellow, pla it's in black plastic, um, there are four inch spacing and three rows per bed. Um, so just in case you're wondering. Keep yeah, going. in case you are having a different um, method on your farm. And clearly there was a significant difference um, between the yellow and red onions. This is the ability. So this is the proportion of onions damaged um, in total between the, the red and yellow onions in this bed. So it was basically one single bed that just we just did all these onions in. Um, and again, it was almost 70% of the yellow onions were affected above ground. So this is actually feeding in the leaf tube above ground, so seeing damage above ground. And then we, and we went through all the onions. We didn't like take a subset of these onions. We, we looked at every single onion in this bed, and we looked to see whether or not it had damage or not. So significantly, there was a significantly higher incidence of leaf damage in yellow onions. So clearly, leek moth prefer yellow to red onions for whatever reason. Um, and then we also noticed something that was more exp um, kind of interesting and less uh, actionable from, or less important when it comes to kind of uh, managing your onions and reducing damage. What we noticed was that the larger onions within each of the onion varieties, so yellow and red, all of the larger onions tended to have more damage. Um, and so at face value, you might think, oh, that actually means that onion uh, leek moth feeding on my onions is going to make my onions larger, right? So that was kind of, when I shared this first with a couple of friends and a couple of growers, they're like, wait, so leek moth are inducing some sort of immune response in the onion that's making it larger? Um, which is not a crazy idea, but what we think is the, probably the, the, the culprit is that the larger onions are releasing because they're healthier, A, and there's more leaf uh, area, that they're releasing more of the volatile chemicals that are into the air. So some of those odors, there's higher concentration of odors around those larger onions, which is attracting the leek moth. Because remember, they're nocturnal, so they're trying to um, navigate and identify where things are at night, and primarily one of the ways that insects do that at night is using odor or scents, uh, recognition of different and different concentrations of those scents. So what we think is really happening here is that they're simply laying their eggs on the larger onions in both varieties because those onions are giving off more volatiles, more of those, those chemicals that attract them to those larger ones. Um, so it's too bad. It but, would have been cool if we could actually Yeah, but certainly leek moth feeding is not going to impact the onion bulb negatively in terms of size. Right, and so that's the other thing too. So if you look at the two different masses, um, the size of those onions, we did not see a significant difference between the damage and the size of the bulb either. So the key takeaway from that is A, leek moth are not making your onions grow bigger, and B, leek moth damage did not seem to have a significant effect, at least above ground damage, to have a significant effect on the bulb size. So potentially having leek moth in your field and having it damage your, your above ground biomass or that those leaf tubes, even though you're having lots of window painting, it might not affect, in this case, it doesn't seem to affect the size of the bulbs. Unless, of course, you have a really extensive amount of damage that might cause some sort of um, entry of, of some sort of disease 
or um, yeah, so or other secondary pest like another insect. So, given that data, the that the outcomes of those data, so yellow onions are more susceptible. We, um, the actual amount of above ground damage doesn't seem to affect bulb size. The key uh, question now was, well, what about the bulb? I sell the bulb, right? As a grower, I'm selling the bulb. I'm more concerned about those exit holes coming out of the bulbs. And as we went back to that, those research questions, the subsequent research questions from our meeting with our growers, several of the growers said, well, if you're saying that the leak moth, the way they get into the bulb is that you bring them in, you bring them in either a larvae that are inside the leaf tube or eggs that have been laid on the leaf tube by uh, a flight that happened to just synchronize with your harvest. As the leaf tube starts to dry down, those larvae then move into the bulb and then the larvae then exit um, to, be, to then pupate outside of the, the bulb. What if we just cut the leaf tubes before we actually bring them into storage or before we bring them to cure them and then subsequently going into storage? And we're like, huh, that's a that's an interesting idea, but we're not really sure what the effect, A, it will have on re removing the number of eggs and larvae. We would assume that it would certainly remove them, but also we weren't really sure of the effect it might have on the, the storage quality of the onion. Because um, typically when you talk to a lot of growers, many of them want to keep the certain amount of, of leaf tube on the onion so they can dry down. That's what many growers told us. Like you need those leaf tubes so they can dry down, dry down effectively so you can have the, long, the longest storage quality um, or you can store them for a longer period of time without a reduction in quality. Um, and, but no one, we, no one had tested this. The one person who had tested something similar to this was uh, Crystal Stewart in, at Cornell Cooperative in New York. And what she had in found garlic. out that, in garlic, yep. Yeah. So she had found out in garlic was that, basically if you cut it, you cut garlic at any point along the neck, you could you cut it prior, you can have it dry down completely, you can cut it close to the neck, you cut it six inches, whatever it may be. She was seeing that there was very little uh, change in quality, at least storage quality and post-storage quality. Um, the main, the primary, and correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, Scott, the, the primary determinant of the storage quality or the post-storage quality was the actual seed stock itself. So how good were the actual garlic that you're putting into storage? Um, how good of a quality was it prior to getting into storage? And that was, and and saw no difference. So we're like, well, if that's the case, why, these are alliums, maybe we'll see the same effect um, in onions. And so what we decided to do was to do, to test that exact thing in onions. So the um, way we set up this experiment was we selected onions out of the field and we cut them after we harvested them. So we let them grow. Um, and just before putting them into, uh, to cure in a, in a greenhouse, um, in a hoop house, and then going into storage after that, after several weeks, we cut the onions directly right out of the field at one inch away from the shoulder of the bulb, at six inches away from the shoulder of the bulb, and at 10 inches. And then finally we had ones that kept the entire leaf tube intact. And then we measured uh, differences in yield between those after curing. And then we measured to see if there, well, we looked for exit holes in the bulb, both pre and post storage. Um, and then we looked at storage quality, and that storage quality was uh, measured by the number of onion layers. We, we cut the onions in half, and we looked to see if there were any rotted layers in those onions, which would determine um, the amount of, of rot and therefore the quality post-storage. And so pre-storage, um, we pulled those, those onions out of the field, we put them in, we cured them, and then we looked at each bulb. And what we essentially saw was that for one inch, 10 inch, and six inch uh, length of the, the leaf tube, basically there were no um, leaf, there were no exit holes essentially um, out of any of the bulbs. We did see in the uncut, the ones that had, had the entire leaf tube intact, we saw something like three or four exit holes or three or four bulbs. Um, in, in the total onions that we selected. And there were 50 onions in each of these treatments um, that we selected out. And so just at this first season in which we actually were able to crunch these numbers, it seems that getting rid of the leaf tube does significantly reduce the likelihood of those larvae getting into your bulbs. Um, and so it makes sense, right? So if any, any onions that had eggs laid on them or had larvae in the in the leaf tube, you're removing that. You're leaving it out in the field. And that's what we actually did. We just left them. We didn't bring. We didn't cut them inside the greenhouse. We moved them out to the field to make sure that none of them pupated like on the refuse in or in or around that hoop house, and then flew into, um, potentially flew in and laid eggs 
And then interestingly, um, again, this is just kind of interesting data point that we saw or um, some amount of analysis around the actual mass of the onion, so the weight of the onion differences after curing. For some reason, we haven't been able to determine why this is. There was a significant difference in the 10 inch, the onions that we had a 10 inch leaf tube, they seem to be consistently bigger. Um, now, and, and we might say that we just chose bigger onions, but we randomly chose all these onions. So the randomness should have been controlled for by the way we selected onions, but we haven't really looked to, um, to, to um, investigate that any, any sooner. And then finally, what we did after six months of storage, we went in there, we pulled out the onions, we cut the onions in half, and then, like I said before, we looked to identify how many of those layers were damaged, and then we compared them at two different farms. So we did that, we collected these at two different farms, at, at uh, Borderview up in Alberg, and then at the Horticultural Research Farm here at UVM. And so if you just look at the Borderview, the, the red um, bars here in this, in this, in this graph right here, and basically, we're measuring the number of affected layers and the average number of those layers within a single bulb, right? And so what you can see clearly is that there's a farm effect here, <laughs> that for, for whatever reasons, after six months of storage, both at the one inch, six inch, 10 inch, and uncut, at all those treatments, for some reason, we're seeing a higher amount of, of uh, rot occurring in the border view onions as opposed to the onions that were stored, that were uh, collected. They were all stored in the same place, but they were just collected from different farms. Okay, so they were all uh, cured and stored at the UVM uh, horticultural research um, farm. But in general, there's relatively low amounts, depending on what you consider relatively low. Uh, the maximum number of onions that were affected um, using this, this type of, uh, and uh, interestingly enough, the maximum number were nine out of 50, and those nine were in the uncut. So the traditional way of allowing those onions to dry down. So it seems that cutting onions doesn't have a significant effect on storage quality. Um, uh, so I guess that covers all of them. Significant difference in storage quality between farms. Yep. So there's something going on at the farm, perhaps, that made a difference in these um, in the susceptibility to rot. And yeah. And the one data point that we see is that actually uncut onions seem to have less. So um, we're at 15 minutes, so I'm just going to run quickly through this. A final experiment that we are currently testing also is the use of a parasitoid wasp, um, a trichogramma wasp that, that many growers are using um, in corn, um, potentially. And basically what this, this there's a, a company in Canada that is producing trichogramma wasps that are uh, specific to well, I guess they're generalists to some degree, but they have shown that they were effective in garlic for knocking down populations of leek moth and garlic, and they wanted to test it in onions. So we set up uh, experiments on six farms where we had a release plot where we released trichogramma wasps, and uh, another plot where it was a control plot where we didn't release any trichogramma wasps. And then we looked to see, was there a reduction in the amount of damage in the, in the leaf tubes above ground? So again, just to add to this whole idea, so now we're talking about mechanical possible control tactics like clipping onions. We're talking about kind of um, now using biological controls as a potential. And um, what we saw was that there was a significantly less damage in those plots where we were releasing trichogramma at six different sites. Um, one of the sites in Williamstown, um, we really didn't have much leak moth damage, so it wasn't really a useful data point. But as you can see, we've seen a, at least a 50% decline at almost every site um, with the release of trichogramma wasps throughout the season. And the way these trichogramma wasps are released, as I showed in this last right here, they're just these little sachets that sit on these pop popsicle sticks. And once you, you do need to identify that leek moth are actually laying eggs because these trichogramma wasps lay their eggs inside the eggs of the leek moth. So the idea is that as soon as you identify, uh, you put out some traps and as soon as you identify that the leek moth fight has begun, you start putting out these uh, trichogramma sachets, and you do that all the way until harvest. You, know, and you do them once a week, you release them once a week, and we've seen a clearly a significant reduction in the amount of leak moth damage um, in those fields where we've, we've re released these trichogramma wasps. So really right. quickly, Vic, I just wanna point out that those data were from last summer, not this summer. Um, right. We did the same thing this summer 
Um, and there was very little leak moth damage in our con in our experimental plots. Um, we lost one because of the it was on a commercial farm and the farmer just couldn't keep uh, the weeds at bay. Um, but the other thing is this summer the intense heat probably decreased the uh, the efficacy of the trichogramma um, because they were grown on black plastic. So we don't have any data to support that because there were there just wasn't the same leak moth pressure um but uh but that's what we suspect yeah so um and that's tbd we haven't analyzed that those data yet but um we'll yeah tbd so and then so some final kind of concluding thoughts that flight data are very useful to use flight data for leak moth, really useful for your alliums for whatever tactic that you're looking to employ, right? So whether or not using trigger gram, you know, need to know when the timing is. If you're looking to clip leaves um, and bring any of your onions into storage, it's potential that if you are actually monitoring them and there's no flight going on or hasn't been a flight going on um, in some time or you missed, the next flight is gonna be coming soon and, and it might be, you might be able just to take your onions and bring them inside without any, without any worry. Um, Moderate leak moth damage might not affect quality, um, but we haven't tested to see this in shallots or leaks um, to see what the actual yield. There's not, a, there hasn't been a ton of research to see what the yield effect is in other alliums um, due to leak moth damage in in the leaves. Uh, biological control seems like a good option, but environmental uh, conditions might affect the utility of those biological controls. Um, so there's Again, stay, in stay tuned with that. And it seems like the post-harvest handling, it seems to remove the, the eggs and the larvae out of your curing, and it doesn't seem to have any effect on the storage quality of these storage onions. So that looks also like a very promising uh, potential tactic to use against leak moth. And I will say anecdotally that at the, at the university farm here, the Catamount Farm, that is run at the University of Vermont. They've been clipping their onions one inch from the shoulder since we even identified that it was a potential control tactic. They just started doing it, and they've seen basically little to no effect on their storage quality. Um, so again, it seems like that what Crystal saw, that, that a lot of this is just kind of some amount of knowledge that's being passed down through generations might not be true, um, potentially. And then, of course, we want to thank all the growers that we work with and funding sources and, and other organizations, including SARE, City Market, uh, the state of Vermont, et cetera. And we'll leave it for if you have any time for questions. Yeah, we have 10 minutes if there are any okay. out there. Yeah. I try to talk as fast as possible, so that might have made things a little bit crazy. <laughs> well, great. Thanks so much. Yeah, we have a small group, so folks could just pipe up or type something in the chat. I do have one question I'll start it off with. Did you pencil out the cost of the, the biocontrol releases for a whole growing season? So the stuff. bad news, Vern, is that right now that this particular, so th they're up in Quebec and they do not distribute into the US. And so, so we don't know yet because it's not a, it's not uh, um, currently available. Um, if, it could be at some point, but I guess could be. what I'm getting at is in, in yeah. sweet corn and pepper. I mean, normally the sachets are placed, you know, early in the growing season for each planting, <clears throat> but mm -hmm. I don't believe they're put out continuously. Why is that the case, or is that just your research design? So the reason why it, it, they're out continually in onions is because of the overlapping flight. The second flight in onions is, is around mid-June. And so if you've got an early um, maturing variety um, you, of onion that you're growing, you might be able to get away with just three or four weeks of, um, of releases. But because this, this, the third flight of leek moth um is usually towards the beginning to middle of august um if that third generation emerges and happens to lay eggs you want to make sure that you've got the biocontrol out there 
And so that's why it's from the beginning of the second flight through to harvest, um, not necessarily, be, um, you know, it's, we're talking four, four or five weeks, um, depending upon the, that growing year. And it's not that this parasitoid is not available in the U.S., it's just that the deployment strategy of these sachets are really easy, um, that they're kind of created so you can put them um, on these popsicle sticks. The ones that are being released, the ones that are available in the U.S. are like on those tabs that you need to hang on to something, and there's nothing really great to hang on in, in an onion per se. So potentially if people want to like figure out some way to hang those things, it could. what do you think about that, Scott? Yeah, I mean, we toyed around with, with the hang tags and and it was just too complicated we we wound up yeah because you want to try to keep them protected from the elements um and from things like ants that will eat the the um trichogramma parasitoid uh pupae excuse me um and so you can buy this species of trichogramma from uh ipm labs or arabico um but but it's not in that sachet format um, that keeps them a little bit protected and easy to deploy, like Vic said. Sounds like a great project for the ag engineering team. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, I think I think I just saw Andy logged off. Oh no! <laughs> Get some farm hacks on it. Andy, yeah, right. Other questions out there from growers or others? I have, I have a quick question. Um, have you looked at creating beneficial habitat for the trichogramma so you could? release them a couple times and build up a population on your farm? That's a great question. We have not looked into it. Um, the, the, the principle with these is you flood the ecosystem and then you keep it flooded during that crucial period. My concern would be if you trying to like take your suggestion of, of releasing them and try and encourage them while they're there. Um, my concern would be you're not getting enough of those trichogramma persisting for a long enough period, um, but that is just a guess. Got it. And then, um, that does, oh, go ahead. I just want to add just one more comment. That does actually lead into kind of the observation that Scott, you alluded to at the beginning of the presentation that we are starting to see in those areas where the initial invasion occur, where we saw really high populations and significant damage, at least above ground damage. We've seen in the last several years that that damage has started to wane to the point we're seeing far fewer, to some degree, almost undetectable le levels of um, leak moth in those regions. And so it's potential, uh, Patrick, that, that it's already occurring, that maybe there is some uh, resident natural enemies or beneficials, whatever it may be, that are starting to increase in numbers as leak moth is starting to originally has that big plume and eventually maybe it does stabilize to some degree. And again, we haven't looked to analyze that data um, yet, but or have that data to be honest or collect it. Um, so anyways, just to give you some idea about managing the ecosystem and its benefit. Okay, so potentially these farms that are releasing them have built up a population and then over time you release them and the, the pressure goes down. Yeah, it's potential. And the other thing about trigger grandma is that they are not highly specialized like some other parasitoids. So they are relatively generalist. So they might potentially, and again, Scott chime in also, that maybe they are, those populations are able to sustain themselves because they will lay their eggs in many other lepidopterans, so other types of moss species. So maybe we are priming the pump a little where we're releasing them, perhaps, mm -hmm. or there's already a, a, like an ambient level that is that is upregulating or, or, or increasing numbers as the leak moth has increased numbers in these areas. I'm not, I'm, again, this is all hy hypothetical. Yeah, My just one final. Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. Oh, I just have another quick, really quick question about overwintering onions. I know Jericho settlers, a lot of some farms are starting to only grow overwintered onions where they're seeding them in September, October, planting them in the ground in November in hoop houses or greenhouses, mm -hmm. and then getting a harvest really early. And we run a CSA and we're just finding like people want onions. They want less scallions and more bulb onions. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what yeah, is there a serious advantage to just overwintering onions and then not being exposed to as many flights, you know, harvesting already in June? That's yeah, a I mean, great idea for the project. Well, and certainly based on trapping data that we have, that first flight in, you know, mid-April um, mid through mid-May, th the numbers are far lower. And so yeah, if you have any overwintering alliums, um, th they're just going to be fewer 
leak mods around to begin with. So certainly a good strategy there. Yeah. And Krista is part of our of our our team, so we can just ask her about that too, about maybe just putting a trap in or putting uh, taking data on damage in those onions. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Hey guys, this is Paul. Um, and thanks for the new. This is some good new information. Um, I want to. Uh, I want to rewind to the row cover piece because I, I don't. I want to be careful about, and I don't think you meant to, but dismissing that because it's hard to scale up. It's like everyone's row covering everything already. It's already on farms, and um, and I'm wondering if there's uh, uh, aside from like uh, it, you know the efficacy, and then. Um, some, you know, any research that's out there that you could point us to as far as timing, it sounds like timing is important uh, with that um, method. Certainly, you got to get the row. So I, I didn't mean to dismiss it outright. I think there are some growers that at a certain scale, it's just not something that they want to deal with, but it's very effective. The The people that do it here in Vermont are very happy with it and up in, in Canada, um where we where we originally got the the information from that they are very happy with it um the moths as i mentioned that first flight in mid um april um and so you really need to get the row cover on if you've got any alliums at the in the ground at that point get the row cover on um or if you're planting you know as soon as you get those um alliums in the ground you have to have them covered um and then as long as they are covered during the flights, they're protected. And so that sort of underscores the point that Vic made before about knowing that the timing of the flights is also important. And the, and the Hort Farm, the Catamount Farm has been doing that for doing the combined of covering their onions with ProtectNet as soon as they get them, as soon as that first flight emerges, and then also cutting the, the leaf tubes. And they've been essentially removed any leak moth pressure in there, or at least the susceptibility to uh, any type of holes in their exit holes in their in their bulbs. That's a good point, Paul. Well, thanks everybody. This was a really informative session. We've hit the one o'clock mark, so it's time to conclude. And we hope many of you will join us next week when the webinar is focused on managing aphids and diseases in leafy greens and tunnels. So till then, take care everybody. Have a good day. Thanks. And if you guys have any awesome. ideas or any questions, reach out to us. Um, we're always interested in kind of exploring um, any problems or any ways to address these problems that farmers need. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>